Right. Those of you who've known me for the last 10 days may know I perhaps don't need one of these. But um, for the purposes of broadcasting, we do. Hello, Egypt. How are you? There's a lot of people there. <laughs> okay, right. Welcome back, fellows. You know the rules. We've been through this this morning. So, I'm now going to ask our new judging panel for Egypt to introduce themselves, uh, starting with our head judge for Egypt, Professor Roger Benson. Well, good morning. All I know about Egypt is Mo Farrell, the footballer for Liverpool. He's the, uh, the man I watch regularly. However, my background is industry. Uh, I uh, spent a long time in the chemical industry because I'm a chemical engineer, uh, but I spent most of that in automation and, and at the end of it in world-class manufacturing. Uh, I've been a fellow for 20 years, seems a long time though, uh, so I've been retired a few years. The joy of that, I was able to have a lovely 50 mile bike ride yesterday and now I can come down and have a very interesting day afternoon with you, but that's myself. Hello everybody, I'm Sarah Turner. My background is in technology and in particular working in and around startups for a long time. Um, I'm also an angel investor. I have a personal portfolio of 14, 14 investments and uh, five years ago now I started uh, an angel network called Angel Academy. Um, what I noticed when I was um, uh, going to the networks that already existed for angel investing that there were no other women in the room um, and so the mission at Angel Academy is to mobilize more women as angel investors. Um, we're investing in technology companies at um, late seed stage usually and um, all the companies we invest in have um, a, either a female founder or a female co-founder. Uh, thank you. Um, my name is Fatih Naragi. I, um, I work for a company called Newton Investment Management and my job is to invest in technology companies. I've been investing in technology companies for the last 20 years, but at the, at the larger end as opposed to the, uh, the um, smaller end. So it's public companies globally, whether it's Taiwan, China, um, the US. Um, and prior to doing that, I um, had my own company and we, we do, we're doing very well, but we struggle to grow and scale and so understand those challenges. And this morning has been very exciting hearing the different um, presenters and really look forward to um, hearing the pitches from um, Egypt. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm Rod Smallwood. I'm also a fellow of the Academy for a couple of years less than Roger um, and a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians because I've spent all of my career with one foot in engineering and one foot in medicine. I started in the National Health Service nearly 50 years ago when there was no electronic equipment at all in the health service. Patient monitoring meant uh, a thermometer and a watch to time the patient's pulse. So I spent a long time developing new uh, physiological measurement equipment and then setting up patient services with it. Um, so that's rather an interesting background looking at the, the uh, innovation and the routes to actually getting medical devices out into the marketplace that we have now. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what everyone has to say this afternoon. Okay, please welcome our judges. Thank you. I'd also like to introduce our pitch room team. So we have on timer Pete Moores. Okay, fellows, so when Pete shows you a one minute sign, please acknowledge that you've seen it. He will then show you a 30 second sign and then a finish sign, okay? I will interrupt you when you've pitched for three minutes. Okay, please also welcome the help of Brian Corbett as our AV monitor. Thank you, Brian. And Christina, I believe, our appointed float for this afternoon. Support for the general room. Okay, and Hannah's at the back too. 
There's no escape. Okay, right. Okay, fellows, you know the drill. You have three minutes to pitch and you have four minutes for questions. I'm going to say the name of the next pitcher to come up and the one uh, that will go after that. The one that goes after that, I would like to go to the AV team over here and they will mic you up ready for you to present, okay? Please try not to cross the camera line and we will you will join me here and I want you to try and stand around this uh, pink cross on the floor here so that you are in the line of the camera. Okay, should we start our last pitching session? Not just the last pitching session for today, but actually the last pitching round for our class of 2018-2019. I think we need a huge round of applause. We all made it. <laughs> all right, Egypt, you ready? Okay, can we please welcome our first pitcher from Egypt, Abdul Halak. Abdul, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Abdul, so Thank your clicker you. is there. Just a minute. Your position is there. There's your clicker, sir. Okay, thank you. Okay. Judges, you ready? Pete, you ready? Yes. Abdul, you ready? Three minutes in your own time. My name is Abdul Khaliq Hussein from Egypt. I'm working in Plant Protection Research Institute. My project is about permanent magnetic sterile insect trap. Traps is, uh, insects is very big problem for plantations in Egypt. In developing countries, as in Egypt, up to 50% of all crop yields got losses because infestation of insects and pests and other seasons. Pesticides, chemical pesticides, is the other big problem for environment and uh, with increasing concern about effect of health and environment, we find increasing, we find increasing uh, demand for physical methods to protect plants from insects. To solve the problem of insects, I developed a small, small uh, device. This small device is actually a trap for insects. It is attract insects, attract male and female of adult insects, and make them sterile. How it works? It works by the force of magnetic field, force of magnetism, effect of magnetic fields on the trap, on the insects, effect of magnetic uh, flux on the insects, on the, in their bodies, especially, especially in uh, uh, sensitive tissues, which uh, is, uh, like sexual organs. This it is effective to decrease population uh, about. 75%, uh, it is safe, it is non-toxic, it is easy, it is uh, uh, low cost enough, it is works in agriculture and also in another, uh, in another sectors. This find, this trap uh, will cost only $10 and works in the field, hanging in the trees and works for seven or six years. It is very cheap one. And physical methods shows it is going to go up. Now, how to, okay. okay. I'm sorry, okay. that's it. So please, thank you for the pitch. You nearly got there, Okay, Thanks. so, judges. Thank you, Abdel. So 
Any questions, please? Thank you, Abdel. Thank you. What attracts the insect to the trap? Why does it go there? Pesticides, you take the pesticide to the insects. What makes the insects come to this? Why did the insects come to the trap? Come to the trap. Really, we have two models of these traps. We, it is inside, in focus point, these magnets and these magnets. In focus point, where, the, uh, where the, it is a strong uh, magnetic uh, field in this point, in certain position. We put in the focus point, attra uh, sexual attracts for the model one, and the food attracts for just a drop, either sexual attractant or uh, uh, food attractant for the every uh, insect. Okay. It's, um, it's very nice to see a version of the, the product. It's, um, it's, it's helpful. Um, so how will you take this to market? <laughs> Just as you want to say, we can uh, uh, to, uh, uh, find some partners like Egyptian uh, Chambers of Commerce, Union of Exporters, Union of Farmers, to spread in farmers, which uh, we have one million acre, each acre have to five to six traps per acre. So uh, a potential market or market potential will have 60 million of uh, uh, dollars. And a quick follow-up question. Can we, we use these in our home as well? <laughs> is this, uh, we have uh, best traders or a local best control uh, traders, companies, local yeah. companies. We will take with the agreement of these uh, associations and with the traders to sell to the farmers. In the, we have one million acre of cultivated area. Thank you, very interesting. Can you give us an idea how you tested the efficacy of this and what are the um, improvements you plan to make? Oh, actually we uh, published the 10 uh, scientific papers in this with 21 of young researchers, holder, PhD holders, and we have a protocol to, uh, to measure how the, 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 the population decreased because it, uh, uh, it decreased gradually, life cycle of the uh, a fly comes in, for example, for in one month. We have end of the year, 12 months go gradually decrease, gradually decrease, gradually decrease because it affects the sexual orders of each uh, flies. So that, that was very interesting. Thank you very much. Did, tell me, what, what are the maintenance requirements for your trap? Do you, I presume the insects fly in and fly out again. What about your sexual attractant or the food? How often do you have to replenish each that? Each fly, each insect have a sexual, either sexual uh, uh, attractant, for example, fruit fly, missile eugenol, yeah. in, in, uh, or food attractant. Yeah, but, but how, often do you have to, how often do you have to change the attractant? Does it last a long time? Every, or? every, every uh, power two weeks, we put just a drop and right. cover it, just a drop and cover it. Yeah, any farmers, it is easy to do that. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> well done. Perfect timing there. Abdul, thank you very thank you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so next up, we have Doa. Please welcome Doa to the pitching room. Okay, Doa. There is your clicker. Now, after Doa, we have Gamal. Gamal is ready. Okay, so. Doa, your slides are up. Pete's ready. Our judges are just about ready. Doa, in your own time. Hello, everybody. Uh, I am Doa Rifat from Egypt. I am a researcher at Animal Health Research Institute, Pathology Department. In our institute, we concerned with diagnosis of animal diseases using different commercial diagnostic tools. One of our major concerns is diagnosis of bovine viral diarrhea. Bovine viral diarrhea is one of the highly contagious worldwide cattle disease. 
because this disease can cause, can cause heavily economic losses in terms of production or reproduction losses besides the cost is needed for eradication programs and establishment of control measures. There are uh, different commercial diagnostic tools that uh, we can use to diagnose this disease, uh, such as immunofluorescent technique. Uh, but all of these techniques are based on natural biomolecules. So all of these techniques shared with the presence of inherited disadvantages. So I am here today to present a solution to overcome these inherited disadvantages uh, for one of these diagnostic tools uh, which is immunoflor conventional immunofluorescent technique. My solution is based on synthetic antibodies or what's called plastic antibodies. My innovative tool can be prepared in a very short time. Uh, for, yeah, for within two weeks, I can prepare it while its conventional counterpart uh, may take a few months to be prepared. Also, uh, the innovative tool uh, is of higher resistance to photobleaching, which the other side is photobleached within a few seconds, maybe 30 seconds. Also, thanks to the nature of synthetic uh, antibodies, uh, it's robust, while the uh, conventional one is sensitive to uh, any change in the pH or temperature of the uh, environment. Also, um, Synthetic antibody can be stored at room temperature and it, it doesn't need uh, refrigeration. The um, expected benefits that the, this innovative tool uh, is cost effective, uh, maybe uh, because the, uh, the uh, uh, raw material um, used for its preparation uh, is of low cost and it has longer shelf life and higher stability. Uh, now I am at laboratory stage. Um, next step is proof of concept funding to test the uh, product in real samples. Uh, and I will, um, uh, I, I will uh, um, looking forward to have an international patent for protection of my product and searching for diagnostic company for licensee. And thank you for interest. Okay, Joe, well done, just in time. Okay, judges, uh, just to remind you, these microphones amplify across the world via the internet, but you guys will have to um, speak up so they can hear you at the back okay. with your questions. So please, questions for Doa. Well, thank you very much, Doa. Very interesting. Um, just clarify, is the innovation the antibody you've developed, or is it the nanoparticle you're going to use to deliver it in some way? Is what? Is the innovation, is it the antibody you've developed, or is it the way you're going to deliver it through nanoparticles? Uh, it's a nano range, uh, uh, in a nano range, yes, size. It's yes, nanoparticle. You're going to give the animal, how are you, how are you going to apply it? Yes, uh, it's uh, a fluid reagent that I will use it in the lab. Um, I will prepare fixed tissue samples from suspected animal, um, then uh, fix the tish this tissue uh, and use uh, my reagent and after incubation, I will examine it un uh, under fluorescent microscope. Uh, the, uh, the positive uh, uh, result will give me fluorescent signal. So I will know that this animal is diseased with this disease, with PVD. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Can you talk a little bit more about the testing you've done so far? Uh, for validation of this uh, product? Yeah. Yes. Uh, I make uh, several uh, tests. Uh, like using a fluoro, uh, fluoro uh, meter uh, for um, examination of the fluorescent signal. Uh, also, I use the, uh, the surface plasmon resonance to test its uh, sensitivity and specificity in comparison with uh, another uh, protein which is non-specific and, non non uh, and not related to uh, BVD. And it gives me good, very good results. Thank you. Um, totally unfamiliar with this field, so um, asking you a, a very simple question. I know you're, you're supposed to tell us all the good things about this. Can you give us an idea what some of the problems that you at the forefront of this see with your own product and what, how you intend to um, address them? Uh, 
problems I faced during preparation? No, no, no. Any, any time, what I've seen is any time somebody is doing innovative work, they are in the best position to see what some of the challenges are and are already planning ahead to address them. So it's an unfair question, but I'm just asking what are the challenges that you see as you've taken this forward? Is there anything else that you obviously need to do? And it would be interesting to share it with us. Um, um, this technology um, is not famous enough in the market. So um, we, we at the beginning, and we need to make like um, uh, much conference and um, something like that to uh, make the people chance to know, know more about this technology and the benefits of this technology. So just to, just to follow on from that, when you want to market it, are you just going to market what you've been talking about? Or is there an opportunity, for instance, to market this as a, as a kit with, I don't know, a fluorometer or whatever with it, so that you could have a cheap package that people could use, rather than it having to be a lab laboratory-based technique? Sorry? <laughs> Let me try and say that differently. <laughs> At the moment, it's a laboratory-based technique, yes? So that you would have to take your samples back to the laboratory in order to do the tests. Could you develop a kit which could be used out in the field by the farmers, for instance, so that there was a much faster and cheaper route for them to do the testing? Um, I'm planning to... Um, after finishing the, the uh, current stage to make uh, like a modification in my product to be used in farms. Uh, um, yes, as uh, the concept w will be the same concept but uh, different forms. Okay, sorry judges, that's all the time we've got. <laughs> Thank you, Donna, well done. Right, next up is Gamal. Gamal's got something for us, haven't you, Gamal? Oh, there is. Okay, so after Gamal, we have Zayed. Okay, so Zayed's going to get mic'd up. Gamal, you ready? You've got your clicker. Okay. You have your slides up. Pete's ready. Our judges are ready. Okay. Hello. Hello. Um, um, I would thank you for giving me this opportunity to, to be here today. Uh, actually, um, According to the WHO statistical analysis, there are more than 400 million people or persons suffering from diabetes. And there are more than one and a half million people are suffering also from dying from diabetes every year. And me, myself, I am an insulin dependent type one diabetes, a diabetic patient. My name is Gamal Ammar, and I came from Alexandria, uh, uh, Sarta City, Alexandria, Egypt, and I'm here to present you my uh, uh, RIBA-free uh, innovation, Peter Free for Better Taste. RIBA-free is uh, uh, actually uh, is a free stevia uh, sweetener uh, derived from a recipe of tissue culture techniques. We developed it in order to produce a sweetener that has no bitterness after taste. The problem with the stevia, uh, uh, usual sugar, you know. So uh, actually, according to uh, the uh, also Harvard Medical School, there are a lot of uh, 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 already found or current sugars or sweeteners found uh, artificially in the market, and they are not recommended at all by, uh, uh, in spite of being approved by the FDA. However. Uh, natural, uh, uh, natural sweeteners are better than the artificial ones. What is really uh, uh, unique about our stevia is that it's three times cheaper than the other sweeteners, ten times sweet, uh, sweeter by volume, and also it can save land, time, money, and labor. So our uh, potential consumers would be the uh, uh, food and dr drink industry, pharmaceuticals, uh, industry, gems, and obesity, diabetes. Uh, actually, market is, we are uh, already developed a sample prototype. Here is sampling. I would like you to taste it. 
It's, uh, here is the uh, uh, standard one and our product, and we are going forward to produce more forms. Uh, according, excuse me, uh, it is the, uh, the market is developing every day, and we are uh, about to invest in Egypt, and we need to invest more during the coming uh, uh, years. And uh, finally, we are looking for uh, uh, licensing from European countries or international uh, co uh, 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 companies or partners for bitter free, for bitter taste. Thank you uh, for uh, your... Kamal, perfect timing. Well done. Right. Thank you. It's always a good tip to bring something for them to eat. Yes. So they can't ask I would them like them to taste, but uh, do not... Uh, I would recommend you to uh, taste First, the sample number one, then after that, sample number two, which is the standard sweetener. Sample number one is ours, but please do not take more than a little bit from sample number two because it will spoil, really, your celebration. Okay, so judges, uh, questions. Thank you, Gamal. Thank you, sir. Very interesting. Thank you. You made a statement there that this will save a great deal of land, time, and labor. Yes. How does it do that? Yes, it is a tissue, because we do this through tissue culture techniques. And tissue culture techniques, we do not need a field. We do not know that need a land. We have our plants and we will make a, like a stock, a stock store from micropropagated plants which are free of diseases. So, and, and does it have any taste of its own? So I'm thinking if you add it to drinks instead of sugar, does it it's change? It's very the taste? sugary. Normally, stevia concentration, if you, it, you know that stevia, it's from 200 to 300 times more sweeter, sweeter as the normal sugar. So we make a concentration which is uh, uh, actually uh, 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 like a sweetie, a little bit sweetie for the consumer, ready to go. Yeah, this is sample number two. Take care from it because it will make a bitterness for, for you. For the, the first one is my product. So I recommend you to use the first one first. Thank you. Um, you, me you mentioned uh, the market, um, but I understand the market is much broader and there's a lot of research going on, yes, etc. Yes. Can you explain why, how, if this is natural, um, why do you need um, any kind of, do you need any kind of approval or not? And what are your routes to market that can be? Yes, it is natural, but still we, we in our laboratory research scale, we follow the FDA standards, which is higher than the Egyptian standards already. You have to go through cytotoxicity tests, through uh, uh, safety tests, all, all, all to be approved. It is natural, but it sure, it has its own concentration and recommended daily dosage too. As, as usual as sugar, all with sugar or salt, you have to take the uh, a specific amount from it. Thank you very much. Te you. Tell, me, tell me what you need to do to scale up from laboratory production to industrial production. Yes, it's a good question. I think, yes, we are, we are, we are looking uh, actually for a scaling up. We need a, a, a space, a sp a more space laboratory. We need uh, equipped, highly equipped and facilitized uh, uh, place or, 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 or a, a production line and uh, some kind like a, a bioreactor. We use a bioreactor because we use a uh, plant cell uh, cultured uh, uh, sure suspension. So that is it is and we are trying to find uh, more, more funds from Egyptian uh, STDF here, where I have the representative and I have the, her, uh, her Highness, the ambassador here, uh, uh, the cultural representative. And uh, I thank you a lot for this opportunity. Thank you. Okay, you. So you've answered my second question, which was where, where do you get the funding from? Yeah. <laughs> thank, you. <laughs> thank you. Okay, any more questions, judges? Too busy tasting. Gamal, thank you very much. Well done, you. I remember bringing toffees once for my judging panel. When I didn't get any questions particularly, and um, they got confused because I was pitching a diagnostic. But I kept them quiet. <laughs> right. Zayad, please welcome Zayad to the pitching area. Okay, now after Zayad, we have Hayatam. 
Ready already? Okay. After Hyatton, we have a coffee break. Maybe, Gamal, we could uh, try some of your sweetener, perhaps. <laughs> okay, right. Zayed, you got your slides yeah. up? Yes. Pete's ready. Our judges are ready. In your own time. Hello. Today, I would like to share with you one of our recent innovation, the novel nanosensor for assessment of heavy metals in water. We all know the harms that industrial activities affects the human being, especially the heavy metals on our beloved children. We have invested our experience in modified electrodes that last for more than 20 years in developing a novel multi-selective modified electrode. Actually, it's competitional, competitive advantage it's highly sensitive to the part per billion range. Its size is in the nano size, can be equipped in a, in a microchip. It's automated, not manual. It can be used in online monitoring system and eco-friendly to protect us from the harms of chemicals. Our market in Egypt is ready for our innovation. We have expanded, eventually we have expanded in fish farms for, we reach about 1.2 million fish farm until now. We have a powerful enforcement of pollution monitoring legislations and eventually we are urged our, by our national authorities to industrialize it in Egypt, to be embedded in our national water pollution online network. We have received an offer from a German company, well-known German company, to industrialize it there. But our new strategy to industrialize it in G Egypt and to get benefit from our business benefits and tax, low taxes and low labor costs. We are in need for, yes, we are in need for 50K dollars to produce our, its prototype in, in just six months, and to about 20, uh, 25th, 250K dollars to establish our company. We estimate five million dollars as revenue in the first three years. Actually, I would like to share with you that this innovation has been awarded from the Georgian Institute of Technology, and by the end of this, months, we will present it in Ocean Vision 2019 conference, and we, we get its uh, recognition. <laughs> be with us to be green. We are here. Glad, well and done. Listen us. Perfect listen timing. <laughs> OK, well, that gives us an image to look at. I am all yours. <laughs> Judges. Well, thank you. Thank you, Ziad. If you Thanks, could possibly Rob. remove that image and get to the second slide. Thank you. Hey, <laughs> I am ready. Just a moment. Now then, what analytical technique are you actually using? Electropolymerization. Electric what? Polymerization. Polymerization. Right. Yes. Yeah, that's a new one on me, is that? I thought. The novelty is in the modified electrode itself, and actually it's BBB range, yeah. all the current equipments in just in the part per million range, Electro except the ICB. Electro what? What? Electro what technology? Electro volumerization technique. Oh, yeah. Okay. And just to explain that graph to me, because yes. you're doing all the, uh, the heavy metals, of which there are many. Yes, the, there are three metals. So you've got some detection to interpret those peaks. Selective detection with a direct proportion with concentration. Did you say three metals or many? Yes, Which copper, one? cadmium, and lead. Copper, cadmium, lead, thank you very much. And we have another three. <laughs> yes. Yeah, sorry. yes. Can you tell us a little bit about the testing that you've done to- Yes, uh, we have, to test, we have uh, uh, tested it in fields yep. and we have a validation. Actually, 
we have tested in five, our northern five lakes, but we'll brawl this ITCO and so on. And we got uh, good results. That's more than perfect. You mentioned um, that you, you can do it in a microchip level. Or yes. Can you explain, because doing it on a microchip level, obviously it's smaller, et cetera, but in terms of cost of doing that and the supply chain you have to go through and the partnership you have to go through, can you talk about the advantages of going that way versus, I assume, if you're already yes. testing it, it's not in microchip level? Can, it you, will can be you explain? Produced, it will be fabricated in Egypt, so we will get the incentives and benefits of our market. Actually, it will cost about $52 no more, resembling to the current, uh, just one analysis may cost uh, uh, us about $50. Yeah. But, but if you want to- be precise. Sure. But if you want to turn it into a microchip, you have yes. to sort of work with, a, what, the, from what I understand, there isn't a sort of microchip supply chain in yes. Egypt. So you have to work with global companies. And I'm just wondering, is that worth going down that, that path? We are here. Yeah, we are but here how, now. what is the cost of going down? Yeah. And we are here today to get license to the European uh, market in the short term and worldwide in the long term. Thank you very much. You were talking okay. about getting this joint investment with a German company. Yes. What, what is that to do? Is they that were fabricated in German. So is that to, is that to fabricate your it device? It will fabricate my, my invasion. So when we you have received an offer from them. Yeah. So when you fabricated that device, yes. it then needs to be embedded in some instrument. Yes, it will be. Yeah. So it will well, be. And that's not what you're doing? That, who, who's doing it that? It will be embedded in our national network for monitoring. No, no, no. what I mean is you've, you've, you've got your detector. Yes. You need some electronics around it. to yes. do. Yeah. Where's the know. electronics coming from? Are you doing that as well? No, it's not me. We are a teamwork. Actually, this work is not for me only. So you we are a teamwork. So you have a link with another company yes, that produces have, the electronics? Yes, we have. That's already in place. international company. That's already in place? Yes. But we are wo looking for an European one to industrialize in, in Egypt, not in Europe. And we will import it to you again. Thank you. Thanks. Tired. Well done. Thank you. Well done. Well done. Excellent. Right, now one more pitch before a coffee break. We're almost on time. Can we all please welcome Hyatam? <laughs> okay, Hyatam. Your slides are up. Yep. The pitches are, the judges are ready. Pete's ready in your own time. Okay, um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Hyatam Hamza. I am a professor at Cairo University. And I'm talking uh, today about my innovation, a platform for IoT-based innovation or innovative campus. We connect, you innovate. So the idea here is that 15 months ago, I, I was appointed as the CIO of Cairo University and um, tried to serve and make happy around 300K students, 30K staff members, and more than 500 buildings with 70 plus thousand uh, IT devices, plus bring your own device. And we did a survey to understand how people perceive our IT services, and guess what? The result was this. So nobody is happy as usual, and nobody is happy anyway with IT, I guess. Sorry, guys. There. So um, what we did is that, analyzing this, um, we invested in the infrastructure. We built a lot of IT um, infrastructure in campus, but what we found is that 98% of the data that we uh, collect goes to nowhere. Most of the uh, IT devices or IT applications we build are admin-centric for people to manage IT, not to use IT. So everybody has ideas. And the good thing about the survey is that they had their own ideas. They dream about certain services. So why not to let them make their own services? And this is what we really did, democratizing the IT services and make it really crowdsourced for innovation. And this will help us to return our students. So our innovation is simple. This is the interface. Behind that, there is a lot of work in terms of machine learning and service discovery. And what you see here to the top, um, to the bottom uh, left of your side is the devices that are discovered all the time in the campus. So suppose now uh, a student wants to go to the library that has Wi-Fi and good lighting and want to go with bicycle. So all what she can do actually is just to drag and drop the elements that she is requiring. And she wants to go there after 10 minutes. And after 10 minutes, uh, what will happen is that if there is a place, it will be notified over the phone. Once she connects that and execute, she will get her smart service. 
Uh, behind that, of course, some uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning techniques. This is a global market. Uh, students everywhere, they read the same services. So we, we think this will be uh, flying for um, different schools all, all over the world. And verticals, of course, smart uh, hospitals, smart homes, smart factories, with the complexity, of course, of connecting the IT devices. Our model is simple. The platform will be for free. And each time you would run an application, it costs as less as uh, uh, 70 cents. And then you can um, uh, build the new hooks for the infrastructure for uh, different uh, price based on the complexity. We are looking for uh, uh, system integrators in the UK to implement our uh, invention. And this is our team here, uh, a great uh, scientist from Egypt. And we are ready to uh, pick up and build a really very smart and innovative platform. Thank you very much. Well done, Mark. Hi, Thank you, Hi, Tim. Just to first of all clarify, you did say 300,000 students. Around that, yeah. yeah just thought I just want to check that I heard that right. Yes, yeah. Yes. Um, <laughs> what is the system you are replacing, the, se the centric system rather than the user friendly? What is the one that you will replace? What is the one I will replace? You said the present system is centric yeah. rather than user friendly. Uh, no, uh, what I meant was that we're not replacing user the system. Centric. What's the user centric yes. system you're replacing? Um, n no, what, uh, what I meant by that is that all the IT infrastructure that we have, usually we build applications for end users that are administrator. So we can manage the lighting of the building, we manage the energy uh, to make it more energy efficient, but we never thought about the end user, which is the customer, the students, the staff. So whenever we have innovation in campus, in terms of the IT infrastructure, we make applications that are admin-centric, focusing only on the administrative part, not on the end-user part. So this sits on top of your present system? Uh, yes. Okay. Okay. And, and how are the end-users using it? What are they doing with it? They can build, assemble their own. OK. Um, so what they do is that, from this simple interface, <laughs> they can assemble their own services. So uh, for example, we are now building something for the washing machines. Uh, if you want to know uh, if the washing machine is uh, free or not and use that, so you can assemble a smart application because all these sensors are there, but we don't do anything by them. We just monitor them as an IT administrator. Uh, but if they can tap into that, use it to build their own application, they, get, they can get notification whenever something is ready for them or uh, uh, if there is a washing machine uh, free or not, if there is a place in the library free or not. So they are using the interface to um, build a service for, for themselves. This is how they will be using that, yeah. Thank you. Um, as you know, the whole area of I IoT applications is very, very hot. Can you give us an idea? Okay, I've got a couple of questions. So first of all, is there, is there anybody's cloud platform that you're sort of using particularly? Who is it? Is it Microsoft, is it Amazon, or is it another one? Um, I'd, it'd be okay, there are uh, 3,000 other platforms in the world, sure. and I think there could be more than that, basically. But the word platform is misleading. Uh, the only thing, without going into a lot of details in terms of the uh, complexity there, uh, this is the only platform that we are aware of that helps um, end user to assemble their own application. We have from IBM Node-RED. Node-RED is a very famous uh, interface, but this is for developer. You can build applications similar to that, but you need some development background. So this is um, easy to use. In terms of the uh, core uh, engine that we have, we are built on an open source. This is an open source platform. We made it open source. Um, and it is based on an open source engine, uh, which is called the Fireware. And this Fireware is well known in Europe. It was you know, uh, part of the EU projects. Perhaps you know that. Uh, so this is the core engine that we use. But we don't use anything related to IBM or Microsoft uh, that are around there. Right. Yes. And, and just a follow-on clarification, can you? You said that you're looking for systems uh, integrator par yes. partners. I thought part of your proposition is that this is such a simple um, interface that once you have the platform, then it's easy for the users to build the services they want. So what is the role of the system integrators? What is it that you'd like okay. from them? So this is only one layer of the platform because the, the engine itself that connects the devices uh, it will be, it, we need to connect physical devices after all, right? So to connect differ, different de devices, uh, we need uh, hooks or interfaces that uh, get these physical devices into the system. So a system integrator will help us, uh, it's a win-win. When they, when they deploy their uh, physical objects, we will help them to connect them in a smart way to make the application usable for end users. Okay, it's added value service for them. Yeah. I'm really impressed with the number of students. <laughs> me too, after I... <laughs> okay, that's all, folks. Yeah. Thank you very much. But he didn't ask me. <laughs> <laughs> Four minutes well. only. <laughs> okay.
Tie it to them. You well saved done. me then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Don't tell them anything else. Right. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Egypt, we're halfway there. Well done. <laughs> Judges, we have six more pitches for your consumption after a short break. So we're going to have a break now for 15 minutes. <coughs> there are refreshments outside. And I will see you back in here at approximately 1.45. <coughs> okay. No, 2.45. In 15 minutes. <laughs>
So, first up, we have Hamdi. Hamdi, please take to the pink cross. Well done, Hamdi. Okay, now after Hamdi, we have Irene. Ready. She's ready. Okay. Question is, Hamdi, are you ready? Your slides are ready, Pete's ready, our judges are ready, in your own time. Hello everybody, I'm Hamdi Abdelati from Egypt. I'm studying in Germany Innovation Management. This is our company, SciPlay, Learn Science and Play Games. Uh, in education, there's a concept of social emotional learning that learning is not about conveying a package of knowledge to the mind of our kids. It's about raising a generation who can communicate, collaborate, and solve a problem together. Actually, this is not the reality of education. Education system is a system in engagement crisis because teachers are using an old teaching method that one size fit to all, and students are not engaged, demotivated, and they are dropping out in developing countries from the schools, and because they feel like they are not a part of this process. The generation is powerful, but they are not engaged. And what we did, that we made a game, this game combining between the education model, an instructional education model, with the game designing model. And we made a prototype of this game and went to the private schools. Because we are now, all of us PhDs in Germany, we visit private school in Germany. And we did a test for the prototype, and this is the result, before and after using one hour of our game, one hour of the game. This secondary school class studying chemistry, and we gamified one topic and measured performance before and after. The performance increased 27%. 37 students participated, 22 teachers. The market, there are many competitors, but most of them are not using artificial intelligence, are not using virtual lab, they are not curriculum oriented kind of games. They are not introducing games, most of them are platform. So the most important and unique value of us is the motivation and learning theory behind this game. And we need to keep it scientific game because we, need, we don't need to destroy the next generation. The market is potential. 80% of the students are playing games. The biggest group are the uh, students between 10 and 19. More than 6 million students in Germany in public and private schools. We had a freemium model, and this is how we can reach the market, direct selling to private schools, indirect through the publisher. We expect, after the three years, $2 million as a revenue, and we are a team coming from different background, business, education, game designer, and physics and chemistry. We had a grant, 12,000 euro. We did a prototype, but we need to finish and scale up this product on a large scale and test it and get feedback. So that we are asking 200K, we need to network of the, of the dad. If you are a dad, just buy our product. And if you are socially interested, that invest in education, because education is the future. That's it. Thank you. Amdi, well done. Spot on. Well done. OK, judges, please. Oh. Thank you, Hamza. Thank you very much. You said that you, the intelligence, uh, the knowledge increased by 27%. How did you measure the knowledge increase? Yeah, this is very important because performance has been measured on psychological level, motivation, and the, uh, the academic knowledge. This kind of how much does the uh, how much unit, uh, knowledge does the students gain before and after. We did a test, and this test was by, uh, written by hand, and the, the, the result is students got just 3.2 3, 3 out of 10, and then increased to be, in this level, to be 5.7 after using the game. So there is a test? Yeah, there is a test. Um, can you tell me a little bit about, more about what the product is? You mentioned platform and there's a game, is it? Currently the product is uh, a game. Yeah. Uh, and this is a game environment here in this, in this section. This is the, the, we call it the city where the students are getting into, getting instruction how he can play this game. And after that, here in this gate, there is a guard. He is asking him about this instruction. Does he get it or not? So students, in order to get into this jungle, and this jungle is full of quizzes, people who are guiding him, uh, laboratory, uh, lab laboratory, and so on, and material. So like in this photo, the students just passed, and then come to this material, and now he can select 
what exactly the materials he needs in order to run this experiment. And then in this, in this environment, there are some people walking here. It's like a real environment. But he is asking for some information in order to pass to the next level. After finishing the experiment, he needs to go further more. Then he will be asked what he got in the, in the last level. So this artificial intelligence and combining between the real player who is the student and the non-real player, who the man who is asking him about what exactly he learned at the last level. As you know, the market for using technology through games, etc., has been is, is very competitive. A lot of people have tried this, and there's an element of novelty. People try it, but how have you looked at retention rates and the ongoing sort of success of it? Because initially, a lot of people try things, and yes, there's a benefit. But can you explain explain to us what tests you've done and how do you sort of manage um, retention um, for for students? Yeah, you are right that there are many who try to give this e-learning, e because simply we are in the e-learning market. And e-learning is starting from video, the scientific videos on YouTube or any open source channel until we get to the game that supplement and complement with the, school, the curriculum of the school. That's exactly what we are trying because we are coming from the academic scientific background. We need to build this game based on a, on a, a motivation theory taking in, in our mind that psychology of the students the knowledge they need to get, and the motivation theory. And we don't like that the market is getting us in another direction to get money or something like this. And this is the uniqueness of this game, that it supplemented the curriculum. It based on the scientific theory. And we need to, go because this market is a renewable market, that generation is going, and next generation is coming. Yep. So the, so the last question is, you had the, the improvement in performance. Yep. If you looked again at those students a month after they'd done it, would you still have the same improvement in performance? That's or, was this, or was <laughs> this just an effect like that because, because they'd done they, something new and interesting? Actually, we, we need to repeat this, and this one of our, our next step to test, and to test this concept on a large scale of, us, of the students so that we can agree this concept is valid or not. Hamdi, that's it. That's all you need to say. Thank you very much. Thank well you. done. Four minutes is up. <laughs> OK. Irene's up next. Yes. Please take to the pink cross. OK. Make yourself comfortable. Um, n after Irene, we have Mohammed. Mohammed's going to get mic'd up. Your slides are up. Yes. Pete's ready. Yes. Judges are ready. Okay, in your own time. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Irene. This is my wonderful team. I'll be talking today about the fabrication of natural polymers um, for, from waste streams for food packaging applications. Uh, obviously, th the challenge is clear. Um, this is a typical image of plastics uh, in Egypt where uh, garbage is accumulating. Uh, it has definitely health hazards on uh, humans. And uh, recently, we're seeing these pictures where um, the plastics is affecting our ecosystem. But let's not forget that plastics are very important. They are durable, flexible, they can be made into fibers, uh, and obviously they reduce food waste. However, I'm, ta I'm targeting the problem of durability in my invention. My invention, Coplastic, is fabricating biodegradable natural polymers as uh, in, the, in the form of thin films. They are tested uh, tech, um, mechanically and physically uh, so we're comparing them with the current packages in the market and they prove to be strong and stretchable uh, they have uh, a transparent and a smooth surface not to cause any damage however we are in the process of patent patenting uh, in nile university that's why i'm not able to uh, tell more about the ingredients of my composite however my, my composite is like uh, getting the best of both worlds it's biodegradable and prolonging the shelf lifetime of food uh, so, um, if we compare um, tomatoes without the package, they are being uh, rotten in 15 days. However, with my package, they still look fresh. And uh, when comparing coplastic with the synthetic plastics and the current biodegradable plastics in the market, they have the, b the best uh, property. Uh, so, this is our business model. Uh, Egypt has a thriving market for food packages uh, around uh, 300 million, and our end users would be the supermarkets and the food producers. 
uh, we are targeting um, to find um, we are targeting to find a manufacturer developer uh, who will be able to help us to manufacture filaments and pellets. Uh, they are the two common uh, types of plastics that could be used uh, in all products. So pellets for food packages and filaments for 3D printing. So our ask is a development partner and ideally a licensee. Uh, and this is my uh, project uh, award winning in our country. And here is my context if you wish to. Okay, thank you. Irene, well done. Great pitch. Really good pitch. Thank you so much. Okay, judges, questions. Oh, thank you, Irene. Uh, clearly, the world wants biodegradable plastic. I used to make plastic, so I know both sides of this. But how does the pile of plastic bottles you showed us on the picture, how does that get from there to the cove, whatever you call it, cove, the plastic, the biodegradable plastic? What's the process that you would make it happen? Uh, I'm trying to eliminate this. Uh, Synthetic plastic. Eliminate. Yeah, so I'm so I'm ge I'm getting my plastic from other s waste streams right. like agriculture waste, uh, waste from crustaceans, and doing some chemical treatments to produce a final shape of a film, where I can like cover up the food. Uh, to be more precise, uh, there are different components according to the type of food that will be covered. But you must extrude the plastic or something. Yes, I'm I'm you I'm just extrude the plastic. Yes. Yes, I'm just using another type of plastic which is natural. It has nothing to do with the picture. Ah, okay, thank you. <coughs> I'm just trying to um, understand who your licensee partners would, would be. Yes, and, um, and what, what I mean, you need them to do. Since we are in the lab scale, so we're, we're just producing filaments, uh, sorry, um, like um, films without um, like a precise uh, mass production technique. So that's why, w where I need a licensee to to help me in producing the mass production. Okay, so, m so it's, manu it's, yeah. a manufacturer. Yes, it's, a, it's as if like I'm just doing now one cup of tea, but I'm asked to do hundreds in, in a minute, so that's the problem. Okay. Um, clearly a big problem you're tra tackling. Can you um, help us understand in terms of like three key differentiators of your, your methodology or s like v and who, who are you differentiating against? Like who would be your competitors? Uh, there is a clear competitor now, which is the technology which is really famous actually in the UK. It's a D2W technology where biodegradable plastics are still, uh, I mean, degrade through a synthetic material. So this is my main competitor. I'm trying to do a different technology where it's a natural one. So uh, am I right that your feedstock is th is the waste plastics? Or? Uh, the, the, I mean, the crustaceans waste is my source of uh, package. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I mean, crustaceans could be fish, uh, shrimp, any, any other, I mean, any shells. Could, I could use oh. their waste and treat it uh, and add some agriculture waste right. to help uh, get the final yeah. shape of it. So, so is, I mean, with normal waste, uh, plastic processing, the sorting is the really key element. Do you have any problems with sorting the input feedstock that you're using? Uh, yes, I do. I do this sorting uh, in a process. I mean, uh, I treat the crustaceans alone and then I treat the, the agricultural waste alone and then combine them in a separate process. So I actually I, I've done a feasibility study on how to collect the agricultural waste in Egypt. And I know like four or five sources that are really uh, like rich so I can cover up all the amounts of plastics needed in, in Egypt, at least. Right, and that will be sufficient if you expand your production? Yes, of course. Thank you. OK, no more questions? Great. All right, Irene, well done. <laughs> Brilliant pitch. <laughs> Mohammed, take to the pink star. Yes, come on, please, give it up for Mohammed. <laughs> After Mohammed, we have Khalid. Oh, there you are, sir. Great. That's my seat. <laughs> Honestly. There's plenty more. Right. OK. Mohammed, you ready? Yes. You're ready. The judges are ready. Pete's ready in your own time. Hello, everyone. I'm Mohammed Ibrahim from Oslo University, Egypt, and I'm trying to keep the lights on. So no one wants to see power outage news uh, especially if you are a utility company, because you have to compensate your customers. But power outage happens. So if we look to these two maps, the first one here shows the incident of power outage in London last Wednesday. And here, this London, UK, and the other one is the incident of power outage happened in London, Canada. And this was, 
a massive one that lasts for more than an hour and affected 25,000 customers. And we are trying to help the utility companies by providing them with a better monitoring system to know more about their, their networks. So if we have a look to a conventional electricity system consists of generation, transmission, and distribution. And distribution simply is your utility company, the one provides the customers and customers electricity. But it's somehow a very diverse network. You have consumer like cities, homes, and so on, producer like wind energy and solar cell. And sometime you are a consumer and sometime you are a producer if you have a solar cell in, in the top of your roof and so on. So it's a very hard, a complicated network and you need many nodes to, uh, to monitor and you need it with higher accuracy. So we're trying to find a better solution for monitoring the distribution networks than the ones used now. So we use a concept of sink roof uh, phaser measurement unit or uh, trying to develop a system that depends on hardware, the measurement unit that is located at optimal places in the network. These nodes efficiently and accurately collect the data synchronously at the very same moment, the very same second, and send it to the internet through the monitoring system. Feed the monitoring system software with this data as they are in the very same time, you can have a map or a clearer view about your network and the power flow there. So, Currently, we have a prototype, a tested prototype now, and we are contributing with our utility company to study it on large scale in our university campus. We are a group of four professors. This is my photo a few years ago. This is me. <laughs> and we are trying to now to scale up to this unit. Uh, we started 2008 by a fund from NTRA. We have prototype. Hopefully, we can secure IB and go to local market. Market size, we have our pilot custom has 24 nodes to be monitored. That means about 8,000 units to be sold, do the mass. We need from UK a pilot customer or a, a partner. We believe that UK is a very flexible and very adaptive market and will be very helpful. We will provide you with an efficient solution and an expert team. Thank you. I have a well done. Well done. Fantastic. Well done. I'll take your clicker. OK. Questions, panel? Well, thank you, Mohammed. Thank you. Um, Egypt is not the first country in the world to have power cuts. <laughs> um, who's your competition? Yes, okay, so we have a, okay. In this type, we have PSL from California, USA. They came from academia also, partner with academia and uh, PSL as a company. They somehow advanced from us by two steps. We are trying to get the same accuracy, but with, uh, with a better price. Okay, so the same concepts applied, but in different type of networks. Okay. What, what testing have you done for your technology? So we tested the prototype. We uh, tested its uh, feasibility. So we collected the data in, in, the, in the way we, we need and transmitted to transmission uh, to the monitoring server, which now just monitoring the network, doesn't do advanced steps. Uh, currently, we're trying to do that in a large scale in different nodes and collect the data from these different nodes and combine this uh, together. Okay. okay. Sort of to, to understand, so you basically do like out of band signaling away to, to sort of understand what the um, power requirement, yeah. ha what's happening in the power to then centrally do the c controlling to yes. adjust for the vari okay. uh, variability, is mm -hmm. that right? And is there, so in terms of value, is there some way for you to express the value you're adding to the utility so that they can see what it is but through this feedback system, what is the value there that you're adding? So therefore, make the go-to-market go easier. Okay, I, I'll give you a simple example. If you are, have a home with rooftop solar cell, sometimes you inject power in the morning, say, to the network, and sometimes you consume. Suppose that it's a very sunny day and everyone is injecting power to the system or the, to, to the grid. That may be harm, harmful. So if you, as a utility company, has this view about how the power flow, you can control it. If you don't, you cannot. That's a simple point. Thank you very much. Uh, th this is a, for the UK, this is a really serious problem. I was reading on the train coming down <laughs> that a dark startup of the, of the electricity grid in the UK could take a week. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I, are you just monitoring the grid or are you monitoring and, ma and, and managing the grid? So basically, uh, you are monitoring. And you provide the utility company with information uh, that enables them to take a decision. But 
usually is what happens that you just monitor the, uh, the grid. You provide them with information enough to take the another decision or uh, make load balancing other thing. But you don't, uh, in our scope, we do not control directly the transformers or the nodes we are monitoring. Right. And I presume that you that the diversity of the sources you can cope with. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Thank you. Okay. Judges, we're done. Mohammed, thank you so much. Well done. Well done. Halid? Right. Halid's up next. Okay. And after Halid, we have Mahmoud. There's Mahmoud. He's going to get all mic'd up. Right. Okay. Halid, looks like your slides are up. Yes. Got your clicker? Yeah. Pete's ready. Judges are ready. In your own time. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Khaled Gaffar, professor at the University of Sadat City. My innovation dealing with recycle of agricultural waste to high nutritive value feed that's named BioF. The problem in Egypt, there is a lot of agricultural waste, maybe yearly about 64 million tons per year. And that's uh, most of the farmer and most of the, of the, uh, of the sector, they produce the agricultural waste. Uh, burn it and producing a lot of pollutants, environmental pollution, and black cloud all over Egypt. This is a new, a new modern photo taken from Egypt. About 10 percent from this agricultural waste are uh, recycled, but there is uh, uh, 90 percent not recycled till now. This need new technology, and we have this new technology. New technology is a, a microbial formula, is BioF. And we have the agricultural waste, and we have the feed producer the dealing with the recycling. This, after recycling, produce high nutritive value feed with high protein percent, maybe reach about 30 percent. This is a challenge. Also, the fiber is reduced to less than 10 percent. That's other challenge. And it can be the farmer feed to the animal, poultry, and fish, and they're producing sheep, uh, sheep meat and feed because this product is very cheap for the user. Our marketing opportunity in Egypt, 60 million ton need about 300,000 uh, 300, liter of BioF, that is all over Egypt. Uh, one liter costed about 20, uh, 20 pounds uh, of BioF, and this needs about 6 million uh, pounds for all over Egypt to recycling that 90%. This is the benefit for the users, the end user, the reduced economic high nutritive value feed cost it about, uh, uh, it can substitute, uh, uh, substitute the soya bean meal uh, and substitute the high nutritive feed, maybe cotton seed, the cost of it is very, is very low and is very cheap for the end user. We ask for feed producer as experimental trial. This is first you can contract, and uh, after that, uh, after that we we have now the prototype and the customer trial, and we can start up the company with scale up during the 21, 22, 23, or uh, another partner. And I give him the license, maybe UK or Egyptian. I give him the the, the license, and he can produce the uh, product. Why us? We ask is specified team, uh, uh, BI about said, uh, by I and the team about uh, 35 uh, publication, uh, publication uh, experience uh, in this uh, area. We have six uh, years experience in the biotechnology field, and we have about 30 publication, uh, uh, 30 publication uh, in the nutrition field. And also, why now? Why now? Because the agricultural waste increased as we saw in 2010. Okay, uh, Halid, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for. That's it. Thank, thank you Halid very much. much. Thank you very much. Well done. <laughs> Just about. Thank you. It in. Time. Judges, <laughs> please. Well, thank you, Howard. Could you just tell us a little bit about how you get from the waste to the bag full of feed? What's the process that converts the waste to feed? Yeah, so the, the waste, the, uh, the, the, they can, uh, we can collect the waste and the, uh, the, the feed producer can collect the waste or we can collect the waste, our specific uh, transporter can collect the waste and give him the, uh, feed, uh, the, uh, the feed producer and with my patent, he can uh, ferment it and the process of fermentation, biotechnological fermentation and that's, I think, about six or seven days, I get the uh, end uh, feed uh, product. Uh, 
who, who are your customers and, and what role do they play in the process of getting this to market? My, my direct, direct customer, firstly, is the feed, uh, feed producer. This is the, the first customer for my product, is the feed producer. But the end user may be the farmer for the animal or the poultry or the fish. Okay, but you're, you're, you're selling, selling your process to feed producers? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Just to follow up on that, is there not a conflict for the feed producer to use your product as opposed to what they're currently using? Is, is economically, is it valuable for them to, to go with you or w compared to what they're currently doing? The, the, first, cho the first choice, I, I, I search about this feed producer. This is the first choice for me because I can have a big company and so. But the second uh, uh, solution or the second uh, uh, subject is maybe I have a partner from UK or from Egyptian can deal with the uh, oil process. So at the moment you're producing your BioF on a laboratory scale yes. and in 2021 I think you're talking about being at an industrial scale. How do you, how do you get your from the laboratory scale to that intermediate scale that you need to do all your trials yes i i i i, I see i search now about this feed producer i make the experimental by him uh, and after the experiment and confirmation of my result i can deal with him when i find it i find him or i have a partner who can deal with the uh, old problem all, all process yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you. Okay, well done. You. Well done. Khaled, right. We noticed how efficient our judging panel is. Do we have a prize for the best judging panel, Pete? <laughs> a great British prize. Very efficient with their questioning. Right. Mahmood. Now, after Mahmood, we have our last pitcher, everyone. Oh. Would you like some more? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so our last picture is Tarek. Can I see Tarek? Brilliant. Okay, so Mahmoud, you got your slides. Yep. We've got our judging panel. Good. We've got our timer in your own time. Okay. Hi, I'm Mahmoud Raiz. I'm a researcher and a civil engineer. And I have to tell you that London is great. One of the main attractions for me was their masonry buildings. I enjoyed their beauty, I enjoyed their complexity, and more importantly, I enjoyed how they stood the test of time and they are stand still standing after hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, we don't do buildings like this anymore. We use concrete. Concrete is faster, it's cheaper, and it is more convenient in so many ways including that we don't spend four years shoring them and fixing them and spending 60 millions fixing them. But concrete has a drawback, concrete cracks. Be because these cracks are not the ugly, scary, big cracks that we see, uh, I mean the small, tiny hair cracks, they have a design lifetime of 80 to 100 years. These small cracks allow moisture to seep in, reach the reinforcement and the reinforcement thrust, and then we have to either do costly repairs or demolish it and start from the beginning. And to start from the beginning, I mean that we will put a lot of resources for a shelter that will stay only for 80 to 100 years. I don't think that's a sustainable cycle, and I don't think that our ancient builders would appreciate what we are doing right now. So I want to fix, to change that. And to change that, we have to understand what we are actually doing right now. So the concrete producer use cement aggregates and admixtures, mix them together, and then sell it to the constructor. What I want to do is ask these people to change their product completely by adding a little bit of powder. This powder is actually bacterial spores. These bacterial spores remain dormant in the concrete. They don't activate until the cracking occurs and the moisture come in. They use the moisture, they build calcium uh, calcite, and then the cracks are filled. I want to change the world, and I'm doing that using the global con uh, concrete production. It's a absolutely 
amazingly <laughs> huge industry and they have big effect on the environment. And if we can, when I affect these people and reduce their emission and their land waste, the people will feel it, the planet will feel it. And while doing that, I'll take a bit of the admixture business, which is at 14 billion right now. We did the research, we had a lab scale prototype, and we are now working on the commercial proof of concept. Mamu, time's up. And we time's need some up, money. We need some money. <laughs> okay. Nearly there, well done, okay. well done, man. All right, judges. Well, Questions. Thank you, Mamu, and thank you for the, uh, during our building. You should have got a Romans here, one day the last week. Oh. However, as I understand it, you put spores into the concrete. Yes. When water gets in, the spores react with the water and build an, another layer of concrete. How does that deal with the rust? <coughs> well, they fill the gaps so that the moisture will not actually go through to the uh, reinforcement. So if the, the reinforcement doesn't get a contact with the moisture, then no rust. Can you tell us a little bit more about your um, anticipated journey for getting this from the lab to the market? The, yeah, the slide sure. that you didn't <laughs> get to talk about. Well, uh, right now we, are, we have the prototype as uh, small cubes. Um, we want to do the bigger scale prototype with uh, reinforcement inside and uh, make sure that the idea or the concept is actually uh, workable on the long run so that the steel does not uh, rust or anything and then uh, do the large manufacturing of the spores and uh, sell it to the concrete producers. Thank you. Uh, again, concept of self-healing buildings, it, a lot of research being done there. Yes. Can you um, contrast what your product is compared to some of the others um, in the, that who are, who are going down this journey and, and where do you think you are time-wise and uh, 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 product-wise? Thank you. Well, uh, there are some uh, competitors who are a little bit more advanced. They have uh, the solution that you add to the concrete building when it cracks so it would self-heal. But this is what I'm looking for is something that you add in the concrete as a, a basic material. So it's a little bit different in uh, the science scientific community there are those who are doing the same thing but the thing is um, my first step will be doing it in Egypt and I think that has a very beneficial effect because our regulatory systems will allow us to fast track the production. Thank you, that's, that's a very nice idea. Um, if you're going to change the world you're going to need an awful lot of bacterial spores. What is the source of them? How do, how do you produce sufficient uh, yes, right now, as in my small scale lab, uh, we have this small. Uh, uh, a bioreactor? Yes. Uh, we hope that after we do that large scale model, we'll get the bigger uh, models to produce more, uh, more amounts, <laughs> more quantities. So you're going you're gonna to need a partner to do that? Most probably, yeah. yes. Uh, but not for the next, not for the next step. Maybe you're talking two steps on the road forward. Okay, thank you. Well done, Mamou. Tarek. Yes. Do you think you deserve a huge round of applause for being our last pitcher? <sighs> I don't Come know, on, I don't know if it's good or not that. Last picture from Egypt, last picture of the day, last picture of the class of 2018-19. Right. The slides are up. Pete's there. Judges are ready in your own time. Okay, my name, hi everybody. My name is Tarek Sabri. Uh, uh, my presentation about zero energy combat unit for wastewater treatment in rural areas. Uh, half of the, our population in Egypt is suffering from uh, lack of uh, sanitation system uh, and still depend on the cesspit, in, uh, which is pollutes uh, groundwater and pollutes uh, stream, water stream, and same time has the adversely effect of agricultural land. Normal idea like uh, using conventional central uh, sewage treatment plant, it's very costly and sometimes need skilled labor. 
okay, and large footprint. We think that uh, our innovation, which is zero energy compact unit ZECO system, is a solution for this problem. System development. Uh, the first uh, development of the system, we use what we call it USPR, which is an uh, upflow septic tank buffered reactor. Uh, it's two stages anaerobic, upflow septic tank, followed by anaerobic buffered reactor, and we get a good result of uh, effluent quality, which is going with uh, regulation. Uh, compared to conventional treatment plant, uh, USPR is much less in land requirement and much less in cost and it's uh, less complexity in operation, easy to operate. This is a conventional and this is our, my, uh, our system. Okay, we have already in place uh, four of, uh, of compact unit, okay, and uh, sorry, not four of, uh, of USPR, uh, uh, beginning, uh, started from 2005 and it's distributed in Egypt and in KSA. Uh, from this technology, I have, award, uh, uh, I have a WAN award and uh, funds, as you can see here. The next development of the system, we use what you call it Zico system, which is in compact shape, and uh, it's easy and take uh, very small uh, land, and we have prototype now, uh, 60 to 90 people uh, can be served by this. Potential market, public sector, government, NGO, and charity uh, foundation. In private sector, uh, I think that we can invest in resorts, invest in high-rise building, invest in manufacturing company, and invest in villas in small communities. Uh, what I bring, or what I have, uh, design manual, or know-how, I have a great track record, and at the same time, zero energy, low cost uh, solution. Uh, I'm looking for a partnership with a partner who can make uh, uh, market re uh, uh, reach across Egypt, ability to scale up the system, investment money, uh, and the human resource. Thank you. Okay. Well done, Tarek. So, judges. Well, thank you, Tarek. What happened after 2009? Ah, this is a very good question. Uh, as I, you can see from my last, uh, last slide here, I'm not good in marketing. I'm not good in marketing, okay? I need somebody who can m make marketing for me or can reach me, reach a uh, market for me, uh, really. And uh, sometimes I'm, I'm busy with other things. But normally, uh, I'm not uh, good in marketing, okay? And, and who will that marketing partner be? What kind of a business? Uh, can be a manufacturing company, can be a charity, uh, uh, sorry, NGO, yep. uh, oh, sh charity, uh, oh, sorry, maybe it's not working. Anyway, or a uh, charity foundation or something like that. Okay. okay. Or investor, investor who wants to uh, earn the money, it can be. But will they manufacture for you or are you going to uh, do that yourself? No, I have only, uh, I, uh, uh, of course I can do uh, both, but I prefer to be uh, with know-how, with design manual, yeah. Uh, it's better than to manufacture by myself. Okay. Thank you. Um, are, can you tell us what, if any, are key critical components that you rely on that are sort of produced by others? Like who would be your natural, uh, are there any elements in there where it's sole source and is difficult to, to acquire? Um, is, or are the building blocks, are they just standard parts? Uh, yeah, yeah. It's if you, you ask me what I'm, give so, so when you build your system do you yes. rely on anybody particular is there any techno embedded technology in there which relies on or a component or anything that relies on anybody or is it all mechanical and uh, as i told you as, as I, I explained here not working here anyway it's 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 a, it's a very simple idea uh, which is uh, it's a, I mean, um, opposite all uh, of all the others speaking about smart solution and very high tech uh, solution i'm no, opposite completely opposite very simple simple to operate, no need to, uh, to scale labor. Uh, I have one of this system, still working, it's 12 years now, still working with very good result, and it's operated by the, the man who donates the land. He's an illiterate person, he cannot, uh, he never worked in this uh, t uh, technology before, or, or any wastewater technology, and it's still working very good. As someone who still has a septic tank, I appreciate your solutions. <laughs> um, Looking at your pictures, I, it, it seemed to me that you, your 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 first solution, could, have, what's the problem? could have been built um, 
by unskilled labour. Your second, more compact one, looked to me as if it had to be manufactured by skilled labour. Is that, is that correct? Is there a, a conventional one? Yeah. The conventional one is, has to be skilled labour to work and the operator, good operator, with mechanical and electrical background and to understand the process, there's a, there's a conventional one. Mm -hmm. in, in my system, it's not like this. Oh. No, 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 what I meant was you, you, sh you showed us two versions of your system. Ah, yes, yeah. I have two, two generations. Yeah. First and generation is two stages, and after that, I, I, I add new stage and make it in a compact shape. Yeah. And it, the, first, the first stage system looked to me as if it could be built by unskilled labor. Built by? Yeah. No, it's, no? Uh, it's uh, somebody who is con contractor, concrete contractor, okay. who can do it by, uh, I, mean, with, uh, I give him uh, drawings and uh, I can do it. Right. No right. problem. Okay. Absolutely not. Okay. Thank okay. You. Judges, thank you. Tarek, thank, thank you very you. much. <laughs>